So today we're going to talk about the electronic structure of atoms, which basically goes from the duality of light, like is light a particle, is light a wave, what is light, and goes into what are electrons, are electrons waves, are electron particles. So this is going to be what builds up everything we know today as what is going to be an atom and how are they made up. So that is what this chapter is all about, what discoveries led us to what we now know about atoms. So for this chapter, we're going to look at atomic theory, which is our main model for matter, and figuring out how quantum mechanics gave us a model for the atom. We are going to look at electrons and their arrangement in the periodic table. And from there, we're going to figure out how did we get to where we are right now. And it will give us an idea that will help us segue into chapter eight, which is that atomic structure influences the behavior of a particular species. So the first thing we have to talk about is light. So light is going to be a form of electromagnetic radiation. Um, basically, it's going to travel as a wave. And as a wave, it has both a magnetic field component and an electric field component. Those two components are going to oscillate in a mutually perpendicular manner. But to be fair, it doesn't matter because all electromagnetic waves are always, 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 no exceptions, going to move through space at the same constant speed. And that is going to be the speed of light in a vacuum. So we know that my frequency times my wavelength are always, always, always going to equal my speed of light in a vacuum. And yes, I know that physics does frequency for an F, that's the same thing. For us, it's going to be nu, which is going to be um, the Greek letter. So a wave is going to be a periodic oscillation that is going to transmit energy all the way through space. So we call wave periodic because they repeat themselves in space and time. Keep that idea about periodicity in which you have um, repeating patterns because that is also the basis of the periodic table that we have repeating patterns okay so for wave for waves we have a wavelength which is going to be this distance here between the tops of my wave or it can be the distance between the bottoms of my waves so we can either use meters, which is the basic unit, but for all visible light, we tend to work in nanometers. That is what we tend to use for wavelength measurements. It's going to be nanometers when we talk about visible light. The other thing that waves have is amplitude, and that is how tall my wave is. That is, the taller the wave, the more amplitude it has. Um, Amplitude is directly related to intensity. So if I have a really, 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 really tall wave, then I'm going to have really bright light. That is what that means when we talk about amplitude and intensity. And then the last thing we have is frequency, and that is how much my wave peaks are going to be repeated through a certain point. So this wave here has very, very low frequency. But this wave here has a higher frequency because I have more peaks going through my fixed point. So here's a great question, and that is which wave has the greatest frequency? The question is which wave has more peaks in a specified length? So here, this wave, wave A, is very, very, very tall. Wave A does not have the highest frequency. It has the highest amplitude. Amplitude. But wave B has a higher frequency than wave A. However, the winner for highest frequency is letter C, as in clever. 
So that is the wave that has the greatest frequency. Um, one of the things that we will look at later on is going to be my relationship between frequency and energy. So my frequency and my wavelength are going to be inversely proportional, which means that the shorter my wave, the more frequently they're going to go by a fixed point. And what I have here, nu, is once again my frequency. This is going to be my frequency. My lambda is going to be my wavelength. Okay, so NC is going to just be a constant. C is the speed of light in a vacuum, and it's always, 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 always going to be a constant. Okay, so let's try this out. It says the wavelength of the green light from a traffic signal is centered at 522 nanometers. The question is, what is the frequency of this radiation? So you guys know that C equals lambda times nu. C is a constant. So the constant is going to be 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters over seconds. And that is going to equal my wavelength times my frequency. The problem I have here is that my wavelength is in nanometers. So I need to convert to nanometers. I mean, sorry, I need to convert from nanometers to meters. That's what I need to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and do this the lazy every way. In which I just go ahead and plop that in there and that multiplied by frequency. So then my frequency is going to be three times 10 to the eighth meters over seconds divided by 522 times 10 to the minus nine meters. My meters go away. My units are going to be seconds to the minus one or a hertz. By the way, that's what a hertz is, is one over seconds or reciprocal seconds. So three times 10 to the eighth divided by 522 times 10 to the minus nine. It gives every a humongously large number. And to be fair, all frequencies are going to be large numbers, seven points. 5.75 times 10 to the 14 seconds minus one. Okay, that is how you work this problem. Remember, C is a constant, lambda is my frequency, and nu, sorry, lambda is my wavelength, and nu is what we're solving for. So here's a very similar question. So it says, what is the frequency of indigo light that has a wavelength of 410 nanometers. So you have that C equals nu, which is frequency times lambda. Remember that you need to convert your nanometers into meters. So you now have that nu equals C over lambda. C is a constant, which you have over there, and that is three times 10 to the eighth meters over seconds. All of this is gonna be divided by 410 times 10 to the minus nine meters. So go ahead and do that calculation and let's figure out what we're getting. I am mathing on my side as well. Okay. So, I go ahead and I eliminate this answer and this answer because they make no sense. Um, through the magic of math, I got the letter A for awesome, which all of you are. Are we okay with this? These are calculations you will need to do. So one of the things we have is that all light belongs to the electromagnetic spectrum. So the way I learned it was rabbits made in very unusual, expensive gardens. 
So my frequency is going to increase from rabbits to gardens. And so does my energy. But my wavelength increases as I go from gardens to rabbits. So in the visible spectrum, that is the V here, um, we have the different arrangement of light. And we do it based on Roy G. Bibb. So my red light is going to be my least energetic light. My violet light is going to be my more energetic light every single time. So energy is directly proportional to frequency, but inversely proportional to wavelength. So waves can interact with one another, and that is called interference. We can have two kinds of interference. So for example, if you're interacting in a way that you are adding to each other, that makes a constructive interference, and that is going to make my waves be in phase. That also means that the light I generate is going to be brighter, okay? So, for example, if I am lecturing and you guys are answering questions and you're contributing to the conversation, that is constructive interference because at the end of it, everyone comes out a little bit brighter. On the other hand, if I am lecturing and you guys are talking at the same time I am talking, that is destructive interference. And at the end, we have darkness. There is no light whatsoever. So what we have is my waves are interacting with one another and they are canceling each other. Okay. We are always hoping to have constructive interference, but sometimes destructive interference is what happens. So another thing that waves do is that whenever they encounter any kind of opening, they are going to go ahead and do diffraction. So they're going to create those wavy patterns, which I know sounds stupid to say it that way, but when you're skipping rocks in a lake, that is going to be what happens um, whenever a wave goes through an opening. Particles do not diffract. So what particles do is they create like spots when they go through an opening. Waves are going to create that whole diffraction pattern. So the diffraction through two slits creates an interference pattern. So I'm going to have regions of destructive interference where things are completely dark and regions of constructive interference when my waves are going to add up to one another and become brighter. This whole interference pattern happens to every light wave. So we can think that if light behaves as a wave, we are going to see just this idea. We're just going to see an interference pattern. But scientists did think that light was just a wave up until the early 1900s. Light and every other electromagnetic radiation was just a wave. But the photoelectric effect was something that if you thought of light as a wave could not be explained. We would leave that photoelectric effect with more questions than we had answers. So the photoelectric effect says, okay, I have a metal. In this case, it was sodium. And I am shining light on it, and I am kicking out an electron. So basically, it's I have a metal, I shine light on it, and I kick out an electron. What they saw was, okay, if I add blue light, I kick out an electron. If I add red light, there's no electrons being kicked out whatsoever. All my electrons are hanging out in the sodium surface doing nothing. But the moment I put in a blue light, it goes pew and gets kicked off the surface. So according to classic wave theory, which what we mean by that is saying light is a wave, 
According to that theory, it says that if energy from my light, so my blue light or my red light, whatever light it is, is being transferred to the electrons on the metal atoms, I am going to accumulate a lot of energy. And once I have the correct energy, my electrons are going to get out of the metal. They're going to escape. So according to wave theory, I should see a lag, which means that I have to shine my light onto my surface and I have to wait until the surface gets the correct energy and then my electron gets kicked off. But that was not happening, okay? So when we change the frequency, which means a color, or when we change the intensity, I should be able to affect my electron emission. What that means was, okay, if I make my light super bright, that means my electrons should get kicked out. If I change the frequency, I am going to go ahead and see more electrons getting kicked out. Also, if I had very dim light, I needed to be able to accumulate the correct energy. So I needed a few things. I needed to, hey, maybe if I change the color, I can kick out more electrons. Maybe if I make my light brighter, I can kick out more electrons. But that is not what was happening. That experimental data was not consistent with what we expected. So what scientists observed was that there was a threshold frequency. So if I had a light that had a frequency that was larger than my threshold frequency, I would not see any lag time. By that means was I did not need to accumulate energy in there. It didn't matter that my light was dim. It didn't matter. But they did see that the greater the intensity, the more electrons I would emit. So they saw, okay, cool. Like if my light is brighter, I'm gonna kick out more electrons. But if my light is dim, I am still kicking out electrons. So the amplitude of my wave made no difference as long as I had the correct frequency. If I had a light that had a frequency that was less than my threshold frequency, it didn't matter what I did. I could go ahead and have the brightest light of that color I could possibly manufacture no electrons will get kicked out. Nothing would happen at all. So Albert Einstein, he built an idea from Max Planck and he explained the photoelectric effect. What Einstein said was that light behaves as a stream of particles called photons or quanta. So photons are gonna be a tiny packet of energy and that the energy of that photon depends only on frequency. The higher the frequency, the greater the energy. And I know all y'all are familiar with Einstein. And you all know that he got Nobel Prizes. Most of you are going to think it's because of E equals MC squared. But no, Einstein's Nobel Prize was because of his explanations of the photoelectric effect. Because understanding the photoelectric effect was what allowed scientists to build new ideas, build new theories, and it got us to where we are today in this understanding of science. So according to the photoelectric effect, the energy of my photon is going to be directly proportional to frequency. So remember, if frequency increases, energy increases. Directly proportional. But it's going to be inversely proportional to wavelength. So if my wavelength is bigger, that means I have less energy. What we have is an equation that says E of a photon equals H nu. H is going to be Planck's constant. Notice that here you have an energetic terms, joules. That is how you know you're looking at energy. You have joules as one 
of your units, okay? The other way of solving for that is energy equals HC over lambda, which you can use when you are not given frequency. C is still the speed of light in a vacuum, okay? So, according to the photoelectric effect, for every one photon that you shown under metal, you would kick out one electron. So the photon's energy needs to exceed a minimum threshold for that electron to be kicked out. That minimum energy is called the binding energy. That is how much energy is holding my electron in my metal. And if I have frequencies that are larger than what I need, well, then that electron can absorb that energy and escape because I have more energy than I need, energy is neither created nor destroyed. It is transformed. Transform into what? Kinetic energy. So my excess energy becomes kinetic energy for my electron. So Einstein's explanation changed how scientists view light, viewed light, sorry. And then he noticed then that electromagnetic radiation can be both a wave and a particle. He saw that light diffracts like it does a wave, but that energy is delivered in tiny packets of energy. It was then that it was determined that light is both a wave and a particle. Those ideas are going to carry on to our understanding of how electrons behave because electrons also behave as both a wave and a particle. So here's a tiny, tiny problem. It says calculate the energy in joules of a photon with a wavelength of 5 times 10 to the fourth nanometers and one that has a wavelength of 5 times 10 to the minus 2. Okay, so you have that E equals H C over lambda. H is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34. C is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters over seconds. This is joules times seconds, sorry. And we have to convert our nanometers to meters. So let's go ahead and convert nanometers to meters. Remember that you have five times 10 to the fourth nanometers, one times 10 to the nine nanometers. Nanometers is one meter. So, 5 times 10 to the 4th divided by 1 times 10 to the 9th gives Eddie 5 times 10 to the minus 5. So I am going to do the same process to find the wavelength for letter B. So I have 5 times 10 to the minus 2 divided by 1 times 10 to the 9th, which gives Eddie a wavelength of 5 times 10 to the minus 11. So now I have my wavelength in the correct units. I have my wavelength in meters. So I'm going to go ahead and solve the first problem and show you how to do the work. So you have energy is gonna equal Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times seconds times the speed of light in a vacuum, which is still a constant, times 10 to the eighth meters over seconds. All of this divided by my wavelength in meters, which is five times 10 to the minus five meters. If you look at your units, my meters go away, my seconds go away, so I am left out with just joules. So 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 
That value is a constant. That's where I got it from. It's a constant. The speed of light in a vacuum, also a constant. I divide that by five times seven to the minus five. It gives Evie 3.98 times 10 to the negative 21 joules. So that is the energy of one tiny baby photon of that wavelength. So we repeat the same exact procedure for letter B. Energy is going to be 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times seconds times the speed of light in a vacuum, which is a constant meters over seconds. All of this divided by 5 times 10 to the minus 11 meters, which is my wavelength. So let's do this. So if you math it out, you still get 3.93, sorry, 3.98, because I know how to read numbers. But my exponent is significantly smaller, which makes this larger. Um, in this case, a photon in the X-ray region is going to have more energy than a photon in the infrared region. And you can see that from my answer here. Da. I'm highlighting very aggressively so you can find it. Da, 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 da. So those are going to be my two answers. So if we know the energy of my photons, then I can understand atomic spectra. So one of the things that you were supposed to do in lab was to look at different light sources and see which lines were visible. So for sodium, all we have is this one line here. That's all we have for sodium. This one line at around like 580. For hydrogen, we have four lines that are visible to our eyes. The hydrogen has other lines, but they are just not visible to what our eyes can see. So hydrogen has a bluish light at like 410. This one here has a light at like 435, has a teal-ish line at 490, and a red light at like 655. Those emission spectra, they are going to be characteristic of each element. There's not going to be two elements that have the same emission spectra. So what you were supposed to do in lab was get a cathode um, tube, look at the lines and identify which unknown you had because only one element can have that combination. So atoms can be excited by either absorbing energy, and that energy can be heat, it can be light, or it can be electrical energy. And then they're going to relax, and they're going to emit energy as light. So neon signs are made um, based on that principle that when atoms relax, they are going to emit energy. Another thing that you were supposed to do in lab was to find the colors for um, different alkali metals. So this is going to be a sodium cation. So when you dip a wire into sodium and then put it to the fire, you should see a yellowish flame. This here is a lithium Ion. Lithium always pops out as some kind of like very pinkish red. And then the one that people can see is potassium. Potassium comes out as a lilac every single time, no exceptions. So you were supposed to go into the lab, dip 
your solution and then take it to the fire and figure out what cation you had. Was it potassium? Was it lithium? Was it tritium? That is something you were supposed to do in lab. But my light that is emitted from excited atoms, it can be separated into individual wavelengths. My emission spectrum is not going to be continuous. What that means is that I have only certain bands that I can see, okay? And given that each element has a unique spectrum, I can use that to figure out what element I have. A helium spectrum is going to be completely different than a barium spectrum. They're both going to be completely different. So my emission spectrum is whatever lines I am not absorbing. That is what an emission spectrum is. I am taking in lights, but I am not absorbing them, so I'm kicking them out. My absorption spectrum is going to be whatever's missing. Okay, it's all the lights I actually absorb in here. Your absorption plus your emission gives you the whole spectrum when you add them all together. So, according to Bohr, um, electrons were only particles, which means that they were at different energy levels. Those energy levels were discrete, which means they were not continuous. So if you think about it, a ramp is going to be something that is continuous. So you can go all the way through. Something that is discrete is kind of like staircases. You have one step, two steps, three steps. You cannot have one and a half step in your staircase. That is the difference between discrete and continuous levels. My energy in those discrete levels was gonna be proportional to how far I am from my nucleus. So the lowest energy level is gonna be the closest to the nucleus. The highest energy level is at an infinite distance away from my nucleus. So what we have here is an absorption diagram. I am giving energy to my electrons, so it transitions from level one to level three but my electron is going to be really, really unstable at level three and is going to decay or emit going from level three to level two. And that emission can be in the form of light or it can be in the form of heat. Um, emission is gonna be what happens when you go from high levels to low levels. So that is emission right here. Absorption is going to be what happens when you go from low levels to high levels. So the red is going to be your absorption, your blue circles is going to be your emission. So in order for y'all to absorb to a higher energy state, I need to have the correct energy. So if I want my electron to go from um, the second, the first to the second shell, I have to give this energy. I have to. I cannot give less than that because it's not going to happen. My electron is not going to live here because it only had half the energy. No. My electron, if it doesn't have the energy, it stays at home. It does not leave its place. It needs to have the correct energy. Okay, if I have a little bit more energy, I am not going to live in this area. I am going to stay planted on my second shell. So energies have to be the correct one, okay? If I am in a high energy state, so let's say I'm here at my N equals infinity, I am going to be unstable. Electrons at high energy levels are unstable. So they're going to go ahead and emit. Each line here corresponds to a difference in two energy states. Each line has meaning, okay? So Bohr's model of the atom, he said that electrons can only have specific quantized energy values and that my light was emitted as energy was moving from one energy level to a different lower energy level. He then saw that the energy was minus R H 
1 over n squared. So that r is not the gas r, it's Rydberg's constant r, um, and n is going to be a principal quantum number. So that Rydberg constant is different than any of the other r's we have had up until now. Okay, and it's going to be my principal quantum number. We can go ahead and look at an energy difference. So we have final energy, initial energy, but what we care about is my change in energy in which my delta E is going to equal my Rydberg's constant, 1 over my initial level squared minus 1 over my final level squared. Um, this are my hydrogen emission series. We have bracket, we have passion, and we have Lyman. But the only ones that we can see that are visible to our naked eye are going to be the Balmer series. Those are the only lines that we can see with our eyeballs, okay? So different transitions here. So Lyman's are going to be the most energetic, they're going to be in your ultraviolet region, which is why we cannot see them. Um, my Balmer regions, my Balmer series, sorry, has three of my lines in the visible region, um, only one in my ultraviolet. Passion is in the infrared, and so is bracket. Um, here's a different question. It says, what is the wavelength of a photon in nanometers that is emitted during a transition from the N1? 5 state equals 5 to the NF equals 2 state in the hydrogen atom. So this is going to be a hard question because it requires you to do two calculations. The first thing you have to do is find your delta E. So your delta E is going to equal Rydberg's constant 1 over NI squared minus 1 over N f squared. So that is the first thing we have to do. So we have to find that energy. So I have delta E equals Rydberg's constant, which is 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules times 1 over 25. Where's that 25 coming from? 5 squared. Okay. That's my initial state, 1 over 4. Once again, this 4 is coming from 2 squared. So I find my delta E. So 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 times 1 divided by 25 minus 1 divided by 4. That gives Evie a delta E that is going to be a negative number. So just hear me out on this one. 4.58 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. The reason why your energy comes out negative is because you are comparing with zero, okay? So what you are going to do on the next step is flip that energy into a positive number. So the next equation we have to use is E equals HC over lambda. So we have 4.58 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. And I flip the sign because my energy has to be positive in this case. Okay. So that is going to be 6.626, which is Planck's constant, times 10 to the negative 34. That's a 3, even though it doesn't look like a 3 times speed of light in a vacuum divided by lambda. So I go ahead and I find what my wavelength is. So I have 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 times 3 times 10 to the 8th. All of that is divided by 4.58 times 10 to the negative 19. That gives Evie a wavelength that is 4.34 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. However, 
Evie's not done because her answer needs to be in nanometers. Nanometers. So I go ahead and I convert my meters to nanometers. One meter is one times 10 to the ninth nanometers, which gives Evie 434 nanometers. Okay, so that gives my equation. So I know I have bored you to death. I know that because even my dog is taking a nap. So which transition do you think will give you light with the longest wavelength from a hydrogen atom? Here's what I would do if I were you. I would first eliminate my absorptions. So no, what are you doing? That's not a thing, okay? So then I have to look at which ones are higher energy levels. And I come up with four and three. And that my